Hello, and thank you for joining us for this presentation from Insight to Impact, Winning CEO Support for Talent Intelligence. This program is part of the Sherman Webcast series. You can learn about upcoming and on-demand events from our e-newsletters and the webcast homepage at sherm.org slash webcast. Sherm thanks 8fold AI for sponsoring this program and our series of free webcasts for the HR community. Now about today's program, which will address why every executive needs to make talent intelligence a priority in 2024 and how you get buy-in from your executives. To lead our presentation, we're pleased to welcome Jason Serrato with 8fold AI and Kathy Indres with the Josh Burzen Company. Here's more information about our presenters. Jason Serrato is Vice President of Market Strategy with 8fold AI. Mr. Serrato is focused on the capabilities of 8fold AI's comprehensive talent intelligence platform and the future of work. Prior to 8fold, he was with Gartner as a Senior Research Director focusing on HR technology and transformation. With extensive experience in talent acquisition, Mr. Serrato spent more than a decade with United Technologies Corporation, now RTX, where he was the Senior Director of Talent Acquisition, serving as the Workstream owner for recruiting and onboarding for an enterprise-wide global HR transformation initiative. He also co-hosts the new Talent Code podcast, which provides insights and open discussion with industry leaders on all things talent and HR tech. Kathy Enderis is Senior Vice President of research with the Josh Burzen Company. Ms. Indores leads and develops research-based insights for all areas of HR, learning, talent, and HR technology. She has more than 20 years of global experience from management consulting with IBM, PwC, and EY as a talent leader at McKesson and Kaiser Permanente. Most recently, Ms. Indores led talent and workforce research at Deloitte. She's a frequent keynote speaker, author, and thought leader. Originally from Austria, she has worked in Vienna, London, and Spain, and now lives in San Francisco. Her passion is to make work better and more meaningful. I'm now pleased to turn over the webcast microphone to Jason Serrato. Thank you so much, Connor. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for everyone who's joining us, and it's so great to be with you, Kathy. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. I'm really excited for it, Jason. Can't wait. <laughs> Um, I've, you know, make it a point to track all the work that you're doing and the Josh Burson company is doing and I read all the research. So it's so great to have a chance to discuss some of it and, and interact with you during the hour we have today. Um, as part of today's agenda, um, we wanted to kind of set the stage for this discussion for your organizations to have these discussions internally. So we wanted to start with explaining a little bit about the power of real time skills insights and what we mean by talent intelligence and how it's a little different from how you may have operated in the past. Then we wanted to articulate some of the business case for talent intelligence and provide some real world examples and scenarios that we're seeing from the companies that are already out on this path and some of the benefits that they're seeing from the use of artificial intelligence and talent insights. And then we wanted to summarize the hour by talking about how you would use this understanding to then engage different members of your C-suite if you're starting out on this journey or if you're just at the early stages and looking to grow this initiative. Um, but as the introductions shared, uh, Kathy and I are both um, passionate about this topic and uh, have been in this space for the majority of our careers. So we're looking forward to having this discussion with you, especially as the entire HR function is transforming to move towards this future of work. Right. Sounds exciting. You ready to go, Kathy? I'm ready to go. And please, a lot of questions. We love the questions. So put them in the chat as soon as you have them. <laughs> All right, so along the way, what we're gonna do is we do have some poll questions that we are going to incorporate to uh, engage the audience and, and make sure that you're participating and get you thinking. So we're gonna kick it off with one of our first poll questions. So here we go. How critical do you believe C-suite support is for the success of new initiatives in your organization? Take a look over the options and we'll give you a few moments to select uh, your responses. Now, Kathy, I think it's great that we're starting here because um, you and I both travel extensively meeting with HR leaders and senior executives that are, you know, in, in considering these capabilities and embarking on this journey. And two of the most popular questions I receive are, where do I start and how yes. do I get buy-in? Does that sound yes. familiar to you? 
Always. These are always the first questions that we get, of course, because it sounds great, right? And especially when we start telling success stories from other from other organizations who have been on the journey, who are ready further along. It's like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. But how do I get there? And how do I make sure that I can get the support that, that we need? And of course, uh, for something transformative like talent intelligence, I mean, I don't want to sway the answers, but I feel it's impossible without C-suite support. It's um, because it's going to change your company, really. It's going to change how your company operates, not just how HR operates. What is so the C-suite? Well, like that's, a, that's a good question. The C-suite are the C-level executives. So we call them C-suite because it's the CEO, the CHRO, the CFO, um, so the chief financial officer, the chief human resources officer, the chief executive officer, all of these um, are basically the a chief information officer, chief technology officer, chief marketing officer. So anybody who has like the C chief title in front of them, that's what we call the C-suite. Great question, Kayla. All right, we'll give you a, a few more seconds to get a couple more responses. We have some pretty good participation. Uh, we can still have a few more. So if you're um, sitting there with your hand on the mouse, ready to make a selection, we'll give you a few more seconds. Exactly. Okay, and now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the results. So how critical do you believe C-suite support is for the organization? 59.6% uh, extremely critical. Good, I'm glad. I'm glad that people see this because that's what we're going to talk about now. <laughs> and how, how do you uh, make it happen? I think that's I think you know that's the answer we were hoping for. I mean that's a pretty straightforward question here. We were kind of leading the witness a little bit, but one of the things that's more telling is how quickly the drop off is. You know, there were only a few that said moderately critical and no one answered slightly critical or not critical at all. Right? So that's yeah. a very good sign to see. It's very hard to do these type of things uh, from the grassroots bottom up or to lead from the middle, you kind of need everyone pulling in the same direction. And when you have the senior leadership on your side, you have the wind in your sails, right? And Kathy? Yeah, especially when it's something that's transforming um, and, and really changing ways of working and operating all of that. Um, you can't really do that grassroots, um, the seat, like the level that it has to come from the top because the C-suite, obviously, they drive the culture, they drive the budget, they drive, um, what managers and leaders are working on. So um, I feel it's it's critical. So I'm glad we're diving into this topic specifically. So I wanna go ahead and, and set the stage for what we're actually referring to here with the transformation and the initiatives that people are trying to take on and to give some examples of, of this power of real-time skills insights. You know, there's a lot of discussion going on right now in the market and in the industry and amongst leaders around the value of skills, the changing nature of skills, and a lot of discussion of becoming skill-based. We wanna, we wanna consider being a skills-based organization. Um, I wanna walk through a couple slides just to kind of level set the conversation and explain what that really means when people are saying that. In my opinion, one of the things that you're saying when you're saying we wanna become skills-based is you wanna start to shift or maybe balance the focus on your talent more and more. And what, what are the capabilities that your talent has? What are they interested in learning? What are they able to learn? And how does this mix with the skills we need to accomplish our work for the future, right? I think a lot of our his history and our organizations have been built around jobs and jobs are certainly a reflection of skills but skills really reside in our own and our grow within your talent. So the way I phrase this is I'm talking about this shifting to more of a uh, talent centered design. And if you think about that, what this allows us to do using skills as kind of the, the currency and AI as the capability, it allows you to examine talent through a deeper lens, right? So in talent acquisition, there's been a lot of focus for the last few years on job descriptions. Are our job descriptions accurate? Are they valid? Uh, how often do we incorporate them? How do we make them inclusive? But a big part of that is also looking at, well, what is the actual work and what are the tasks that are involved? And if you start to understand this at the work and task level, you can start to break it down to the skills level. What are the skills we're actually looking for? And that's increasingly important because as much as our, our job descriptions aren't always well-written, they're also often historic 
and the nature of these jobs and the way the work is getting done is changing very rapidly. So even as people look to include skills, they need to make sure they're including the right skills that are going to be the skills that are needed for the way this job is done tomorrow versus how this job was done yesterday, right? From yeah, a talent management, cool. go, go ahead, Kathy. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I'm, every time I talk with clients, um, I ask them, "How long after you've written a job description um, does it take until this job description is obsolete?" And sometimes they say a day or a week or a month, right? Mm -hmm. Because new technology comes around, new uh, new business models come around, new uh, customer opportunities comes around. Something disrupts the market. Just think about what happened um, all through last year with generative AI coming into, into place. Well, nobody had generative AI, of course, in their job description early 2023, probably, because it wasn't, right. it wasn't even a thing. But then yeah. it came around so fast that we said, well, software developers have to use, of course, generative AI because they're going to be developing code much faster. And marketing yeah. people have to use generative AI to write marketing copy, all of that. So I think it's when we think more about the underlying skills that people can use, um, it's much more enduring um, and um, also much more flexible. From a talent management perspective, you know, it's all, often been focused on performance and promotions, but in the last few years, we've been focused on mobility, this concept of yeah. how do we create more of a marketplace for talent and how do we move talent around the organization, both for development, but for retention, as well as for agility. And I think by part of this, you start to look at skills, you start to examine proficiency who has proficiency, where do we need it, how do we develop it, right? From a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective, there's been a lot of discussion around job requirements, right? Are the job requirements valid? Are we setting up unnecessary barriers? Are, they, are we putting in a lot of things that don't allow us to be inclusive? Do you really need seven to 10 years of experience? Do you really need a degree? We've seen a lot of states in the, over the last year remove degree requirements for how they're handling their own needs within the state government. So if you shift from job requirements to skill requirements, right, what it also allows you to do is if you understand those skills, you can extend that further to say, well, what are the skills that are needed, but what are skills that also allow someone to be capable of learning how to do this, right? And what are the adjacencies and how do we um, expand the audience for consideration? And as a result, that creates more inclusive practices in and of themselves. I see you nodding and smiling. What are your thoughts there, Kathy? Yeah, absolutely. I had I had a great example of, of the DEI and, and expanding kind of the talent pool with a more diverse uh, perspective from actually healthcare. And you'll hear us talk a lot about healthcare because we did such a big study together with Eightfold on the healthcare industry overall. And by the way, in the next two years, the 50% of the job growth in the US is actually coming from the healthcare industry altogether. So it's like a huge industry. Um, and one thing that um, we have a great study around, which kind of touches all of the um, uh, areas of talent acquisition and mobility and also DEI and employee experiences, uh, how um, one healthcare organization, I won't mention their name, is actually partnering with Amazon to have warehouse workers retrained um, to be um, uh, nurse assistants because they have such a big nursing shortage as everybody else has in, in the US and beyond. So they have the people that are warehouse workers in the US retrained uh, on Amazon's dime basically, on Amazon's work time to um, be nurse assistants and directly get placed into the healthcare organization. And when we asked Amazon, why do you do this? Of course, it, it expands the, the diversity pool for the nurses too, because a lot of times these are um, a minority, these are diverse people um, from, that work in the in the warehouses and carry the boxes and all of that. And all of this will be, of course, heavily automated with um, robotics and all of that. Uh, we asked Amazon, why do you do this? And they said, well, um, first, it helps us financially. We don't have to let go of all these people and severance. But then it also said it comes right around because uh, when people have um, have higher paying jobs, like in the nursing positions, for example, um, and they go shopping, where do they spend it? They spend it on Amazon. So they don't just do it on the goodness out of their heart. They do it also to basically for financial reason. But it's a kind of a win, win, win for Amazon. It's a win for the healthcare organization. And of course, it's a huge win for those people, everybody who gets a higher paying job, a less uh, physically straining job and a future job that doesn't go away. So um, just a little example that I always uh, like to think about when uh, when I think about kind of all of these together, and especially DEI, because um, yeah. it can seem a little bit like 
amorphous or something like that? How does this impact DI? You really tap into a much bigger talent pool and a much more diverse talent pool than you usually have. And you know, you you even expanded the conversation beyond just internal mobility and a marketplace to one of the ways we refer to it as this kind of workforce exchange, right? And that yes. was something that that came as a result of the pandemic. And you know, it's great to hear examples like that because during the pandemic, organizations were forced to do some of those things. Now yes. they can do them strategically and gain additional yes. benefits. So um, it's, it's a great example. And then the, the last one here is this kind of expansion and a deeper dive into employee experience. There's been a lot of focus around experience at work with employee engagement surveys and trying to get at sentiment to experience with work with digital tools and digitalization and hybrid and remote and flex and asynchronous but when you break it down at a skills level you can start to get at experience from work right what is the meaning i'm getting from working here am i able to contribute to my full capability am i developing skills that i'm interested in developing am i contributing to the team at a greater level so all of this starts to build on itself and gives you that deeper view but one of the other takeaways from this slide and it aligns something very well with the research you're doing at the josh burson company is this becomes increasingly systemic right? we move away from silos and we start to look at these things more comprehensively yeah, you could almost draw these, like the four columns that you have here as kind of interlocking circles with uh, skills in the middle, right? Because yeah. the skills kind of touch everything there. Um, so and I it's think, almost, it's I almost mean, as if you saw the next slide, Kathy, because <laughs> exactly. the other part about it is if skills reside with people, and I'm talking about talent-centered design, I was extremely happy to see this in one of your recent research reports coming out of the Josh Burson company titled Welcome to the Post-Industrial Age. Do you want to walk us through this real quick? Sure, yeah. So I, I think you talked a lot about most of these concepts already, Jason, but really the way that we are thinking this, uh, the industrial age, which basically meant um, we built organizations for industrial scale, meaning we built organizations for just duplicating the work. Like we had management and labor, we had uh, just basically scaling uh, success of the company it meant just hiring more people, getting more people in, who all did the, the same kind of work. It's kind of the conveyor belt or it's like the, the like that concept basically of saying, here's work, we divvy it up into all these people, we put it all together. The more people we can hire, the more people we can get into the organizations, the bigger we get. Well, this used to be the case um, in um, maybe before we hit the, hit the point where we said information is really the, the most important and, um, and most precious area that companies have. Um, intellectual property, the skills of people, the insights, the culture, um, kind of really moving into what we call the post-industrial age, where that's characterized by um, people, be, uh, skills and workers being not abundant. So you can't, and everybody knows this, of course, you're all facing these challenges of hiring enough people, finding the right talent, skills shortages, worker shortages, talent shortages, labor shortages. That's what we call the post-industrial age, where also AIs and um, and end-to-end -end technology transformation is really influencing everything. Um, and in this post-industrial age, we can't just bucket things together in jobs and match people to these jobs, and then they're gonna do the work as we had in the industrial age. But we have to think more, much more about, and you mentioned that too, about the people and the talent at the center and what skills do people have? And then how do we match these skills that people have to the work? And this could be in a job, but this also could be in a project that people are working on. It could also be in a mentoring um, kind of capacity. It could also be in like, internal gig work so it, it it modularizes in a way the job and the reason why this is so important is when you think about the job that you're in and what skills you use i mean uh, we didn't say this in my introduction but i happen to have a phd in mathematics so i'm right. you am i using my phd in mathematics right now no not really uh, but are these skills that i have that i can apply to other work that we have, absolutely, right? So if I want to do other work in the company that might need my PhD in mathematics skills, yes, absolutely, I can work on that too. But it might, the organization might not even know about this because they're just looking at the job that we have right now and the skills and the capabilities that we need for that job. So people have many more skills than they're need, using for their job. And this is really what this is all about, modularizing um, the skills and mapping that to the work and the job almost becomes 
second secondary. You still need kind of job codes and st job structures for your HCM system and just basically to pay people and all of that because that's mostly not modularized yet. I think it's going to yeah. come. But um, basically breaking up the pa paradigm of not just being stuck in the job, but really looking at the people and what skills they have, what skills they want to uh, develop too. And you mentioned that too, Jason. Um, and how to map that to the work to, to be done. A uh, little example on that, we talked with a, a technology company um, about their product manager role, and they said um, one of their best product managers is a person that used to be a sommelier, like somebody who does wine tastings. Um, I said, oh, sommelier, that's so interesting, right? And how come? And they said, well, the sommelier actually has a lot of adjacent and transferable skills because they are, if you have ever been to a wine tasting and a good sommelier really is good at getting your requirements, what wines you're interested in, how you're actually thinking about purchasing this wine, uh, what do you want to pair it with, what food do you want to pair it with, what you're interested in in terms of the regions, all of that. Uh, so they're really good at guessing customer requirements. They're really good at communication. They're really good at uh, taking a lot of information of like thousands or millions of wines and really selecting what might be most appropriate for the client. Um, all of this uh, is uh, all of these skills are skills that are very transferable to just yeah. basically the product manager role, and they just had to learn the technology um, on, on that level to understand and translate it like they had to learn the wines, but they had basically they had all these transferable skills. So sometimes when we're just looking at somebody who has been a product manager for all their lives, um, we're missing a huge source of talent that we could match to the work that needs to be done. So just a little And example. that's exactly what this is doing. This The point of kind of a, a a skills-based approach powered by AI to understand talent intelligence is helping us look at work differently and understand work in real time and kind of think beyond the job to understand the task and the skill and the work and the project and what's at hand. And what this does is, as mentioned, this helps unlock agility, right? To be able to have multiple options for a variety of scenarios and not just go fast, but to be able to turn quickly but it shifts the conversation from analyzing a supply of people to jobs, right? A one-to-one -one relationship yeah. to one of skills to work. And the other part about it is you talked about kind of that industrial age versus post-industrial age. In the industrial age, everything was based off of scale and repeatability and incremental value. Whereas in this post-industrial age, it's much more dynamic. It's much more exponential. Right. Yeah. And it's not just adding 10 people results in the same amount of increase. It is a matting the right people with the right skills can lead it with significant increase. And as you start to understand this and identify this, those are the type of messages that we're talking about when you're going to those business leaders and those C-suite members to understand the value and the support for shifting this kind of approach. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you hit it right on, Jason. Um, they, like just just adding more people sometimes slows people down, right? So it's sometimes it's actually going to get you less productivity if you add more people because you're gonna have, then you have more coordination efforts. Um, it's been proven over and over again that small teams are working much better than big teams, right? Like the two yeah. pizza rule that Amazon yeah. has, for example, sure. or something like that. Yeah. Like just at the industrial model of just adding scale, like adding more heads. First, you can't do it anymore in the labor market that we have. But then second, it's also not, it's not generally producing better results. Um, one one uh, example we have there is that um, Panasonic, they did a study on, on uh, um, basically team productivity um, and they used people analytics to really determine what the what they uh, like what the right um, mix or the right team size was of their battery uh, kind of production. Of course, they are seeing huge increases in demand because of all the solar and all the like renewable energy and all of that. And they found out that actually they, they had their teams were too big, so they were like looking at really what skills do we really need on these teams. And then yeah. they could scale it down to say the teams that were generally like a little bit like 10 percent sl smaller than like the, big, the biggest teams, but they had the right skill mix were much more productive than these like large teams. So they said, maybe we don't need more people. Maybe we just need to select who are the right people on the teams and then put them to work. And that's really what this is all about. 
Yeah, and that story paints a perfect uh, picture for the slide that we just transitioned to here, is that what this understanding and this awareness allows you to do is it allows you to organize around talent and understand the, the work rather than how a lot of this has been done historically with job titles and job descriptions and hierarchy and org charts, right? That picture of the world is very different from the world in which we operate. And once you get at this level of understanding, it gives you a variety of options for how you address that work and how you organize and how you strategize around talent, right? Especially in today's very complex dynamic work, is this done by full-time employees? Is this done by contractors? Is it done by people in the office? Can it be done by people working remotely? Is, are these skills that are needed for today, but skills that we don't need going forward, so we just wanna contract someone and borrow them? Are these skills that relate to our intellectual property that we wanna invest in, that we wanna keep core to our business? Are these tasks that we wanna automate and potentially take off the plate now that we understand who can, who can't, who's interested, who isn't interested, and what the value is. So this understanding of skills and the ability through talent intelligence and AI to understand this in real time gives you these options that help inform strategy. And it allows for, as the Josh Burson company talks about these four R's of as you're addressing the work and the challenge, you could recruit, you could retain, you could redeploy, you could redesign, right? Some of you may have referred yeah. to this as build by borrow. I've heard build by borrow bot, but the whole point of this is the way to truly understand what your options are is to get a broader data set that's informed by the market with organizational understanding, with talent intelligence, identifying your talent in real time that gives you visibility to make some of these decisions, right? Is that, that's exactly what a lot of organizations are coming to you to learn how to do or, or engaging with you to walk you through how they're doing this, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Because I think the most organizations are still in this uh, a little bit like la last century mindset to say, well, we have a new uh, customer need, we have a new product need, what are we gonna do? We're gonna just hire these 10 people, right? So like we need 10 heads, we need 10 people, like recruiting just go out and hire that. And recruiting a lot of times is scratching their heads then. It's like, how are we gonna do this? The talent doesn't exist where we wanna place them. Um, but the business oftentimes is not listening. So they say, well, you just need to recruit them. I don't care and you just need to recruit them fast. And then you get into this back seat as a talent acquisition person, for example, where you say, well, I can't do it, right? Um, time to hire doesn't work. And honestly, we see with that, and you see as a recruiter, you see a recruiting lead, you see in your talent intelligence insights, the talent is just not there. And rather than saying, we just are the order fulfillment people in the recruiting area, how can we help the business reshape their needs to say, well, maybe we don't need to hire these people. As you said, maybe there is like, Maybe this is hiring three people, um, adding some automation to it, redesigning the work, reskilling some people that are internally already to put them into this place. Maybe we already have the people internally. And then also maybe outsourcing or contracting some of the skills that we might not need for the future, right? This is just a temporary need. So being much more strategic around it and pushing back on the business, quite frankly, and, and serving much more as a talent advisor. And I know I've heard this from a lot of your clients too, that having these insights puts them much more into the position of being becoming less of an order taker in the recruiting area and much more of a strategic talent advisor to help uh, basically the business um, support their needs and uh, and solve their problems. So, so Kathy, your team at the Josh Burson Company did extensive research on this, working with your clients, and you published some research on this. And I, I want to take the next section of our meeting today just to kind of walk the audience through some of the stories and use cases that you've seen and some of the outcomes that have happened from early adopters. Would you mind taking a, a few minutes to walk us through that? Of course, of course. Yeah, so when you think about um, getting C-suite business, uh, C-suite buy-in uh, for talent intelligence. And we talked a little bit about why talent intelligence is so important and skills insights are really important. Um, the, 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 the first step to do that is you gotta think and work with the business to identify what is that problem that they wanna solve. And that's, we always hone in on that because a lot of times companies might think, oh, we gotta start with the technology, we have the technology and we're gonna just tell the business why it's so important. Well. That won't work because 
the business and especially C-suite leaders are, near, are very laser focused on what is the business problem that this can solve for us. Not um, here's a cool tool and I I, I want to like I'm going to buy it because it's cool and maybe we need it at some point. So the first and most important step is really identify in your business what is the problem that talent intelligence can solve for the business. And not just saying, well, we have all these problems, but really narrowing down what is the problem. So here we have listed out three kind of problems that, and you probably have all of them, but what we really encourage you is narrow in on one that's most prevalent for you and most important for you. So I'll go through each of these business problems through a little bit and give you some examples. You might have as a business problem, a skills gap, meaning you just don't have the right skills. You have a lot of people, you probably have more people than you need, or maybe the right amount of people in your organization or in a very specific business group that's most important. Um, but you have missing skills and capabilities. So for example, when we studied the banking industry, the consumer banking industry, and I also we did this together with Eightfold and uh, based on Eightfold's talent intelligence um, insights and database uh, data set, um, we identified that the banking industry, consumer banking industry has actually a massive digital skills gap. They have lots of people that have old school technology uh, knowledge and their programming and like COBOL or something like that, uh, do, doing mainframe programming. Uh, but they really want all the banking companies, of course, want to be consumer banking companies that go to their customers with their digital offerings. Because in the pandemic, everybody saw, well, we can do all of this online. We can do all of this, like any banking transaction, really online without visiting a bank. And so you gotta make it easier and you gotta like provide these solutions and customers are really asking for that, but they don't have the skills to do that. And we see this in a lot of um, different banks that we talked with um, and the skills are changing rapidly. Roles are changing rapidly in this, in this case, for example, in banking, that's what we call high skills velocity. So velocity just means things are changing very quickly because um, because of AI, because of new digital um, technologies and all of that, what you, the most important thing to do there could be is reskilling. So seeing if you already have enough people, probably you want to take, you can't hire people as we saw this in banking too. Most banks can't actually hire into the digital roles because most people don't want to work in an old school bank when they can work for, I don't know, Google or, or uh, any of like, Amazon or any kind of cool sure. tech companies, they don't want to go to a stodgy old bank. So if you can't do that, um, you got to reskill people. So it's a different, and how are you going to reskill people? How do you know if people have already the right skills in your organization? Well, you need talent intelligence. So you need insights on that. So that would be the first problem. The second kind of problem that you might encounter in your company is a capacity gap. We just don't have enough people, let alone the skills, but we just don't have enough people. We don't have enough heads to even do this. Healthcare is a great example, and we'll walk more through that. Um, nursing gap, but you've all heard about that. We quantified it together also with, with Eightfold's data set, and we quantified it to be in the next two years, to be in the US alone at 2.1 million people nursing gap, which is massive. It's It means every third seat will be empty in, in nursing if you if you, we continue like this um skills are kind of intermediate um like changing skills and roles are changing somewhat uh, you need a lot of insights on uh, of use of ai and new technologies and all of that but the medical skills still need to be of course in place so you still need people to know how to place an iv and how to me measure blood pressure and all of those kind of things that they already need to do. So some of the skills are changing, but some of the core skills, the core medical skills, of course, stay the same. And what we've identified there, and I'll walk you through that in more detail, redesigning jobs and work to put AI into place, to need less people, less, less highly qualified people, to put these people from Amazon, for example, to work in lower skilled nursing roles. That's what this is all about. And again, for that, you need talent intelligence to know what skills you have, what skills you need, um, and what skills are also in the outside market. That's a massive um, benefit of talent intelligence, too, that it doesn't just show you inside of information, but really outside information as well, what's in the outside world. So that might be a capacity gap, and you might have that as the most pressing gap in your organization, for example, to say, we just can't find enough people, we just don't have enough heads. The last problem I'll mention is... Um, 
we, you might have a misalignment. So you might have enough people and you might have also the right skills, but people are working on the wrong thing. So they're working on the wrong projects. Maybe they're not working into, as we identified with a technology company, they had one business unit really underperforming um, and they identified that they had the right people, the right skills, but they're working on a project that was actually not going anywhere, right? So in that case, you probably have to increase talent mobility, move people from this underperforming business unit. Maybe you want to shut this down altogether, this whatever technology you were deploying, um, and move them into the high growth technology business product that you are that you're working on. Like um, if you're working on something that the market doesn't need anymore, um, then you still need the, the talent intelligence to say, what do we have internally? What's in, externally? How do we match these like skills to to the work that needs to be done? So those are three business problems that you might want to identify first before you even start thinking about uh, going to your C-suite and say, what kind of problem do we have most in your, our organization? I can't obviously answer that for you, but I gave you um, a few of these examples. And just pick one, just pick one, because if you talk about all of them, pick one job group, not say, oh, we have all these problems in all of our job groups, that won't help. But you say, this is one of the big priority job groups or job areas in our organization. This is the kind of problem we have. And then you could say, um, we can we can actually use talent intelligence to understand a deeper, deep, more deeply understand the problem. So we have the healthcare example, and all of these are actually charts that have actual real data from the healthcare industry in there that we created in our healthcare study that we did together with Eightfold, where we say, well, what are the roles that healthcare, for example, even has? What roles are um, uh, uh, rising in need? What roles are declining in need? Which roles are growing really rapidly or roles are like declining really rapidly? It really helps you understand with the talent intelligence how you, what you need, what you have and what you will need in the future. And then you match the skills to it. So you basically say, what are the differentiating skills, for example, for a nurse? If we identified in the healthcare study, nurse, nursing is the most important role. Um, uh, how how do these align with the, what's available in the outside market? And that also comes to the solutions then, where you could say, for example, where are the skills located in the U.S.? And you have this chart. It's an actual chart uh, of the U.S. where there's big skills gap in the healthcare industry and in, in the in the states that are in red, and where's maybe more than you need in the in the states that you have in green there. And can you? relocate people or we maybe do some more hybrid work um, or remote work to actually make sure that you take the overflow and not just try to dig deeper in the, the hole where like fishing in, the, in an empty pool basically. So there you can think about how do we have adjacent skills? What skills are adjacent to the nursing skills, for example, in healthcare or in like the product manager example I gave, what skills could be adjacent for the product manager role? And that could be the Z sommelier skills, for example. Um, and how do we then re, uh, like use what we call systemic solutions? Um, and we call this the 4R framework because this is for us to, um, at the same time, to solve the business problem, to recruit, of course, because you still need to hire, of course. Um, how do you, can you be more strategic? How can you think about locations? university relationships, um, improving your recruiting operations, using skills for recruiting, not just uh, degrees or job, um, like job qualifications, by the way, or jobs. Um, so recruiting is still important, but then also at the same time, how can we differentially retain the people that we already have? So how can we understand who has already the right skills? And then we do some employee experience work. Maybe we focus on pay equity or support people with better benefits, whatever the problem might need uh, be for them to need to be retained, better career growth, all of those kind of things, listening to people. Uh, so at the same time, retaining as well. Also thinking about how can you reskill? So how can you find the people that have adjacent skills and then um, give them some development, give them reskilling and a healthcare scenario, for example, of course, that will require you to also give them medical education because um, just because somebody has patient empathy, for example, as we found with uh, in a healthcare company that said uh, they were reskilling their receptionists because the res receptionists in the in the hospitals um, more and more this job is going to be automated and um, because you check check in with the iPad or you check in on your phone and uh, but they said 
um, if people are interested in going into the medical field, reception is a great future nursing uh, potential because if you think about it, they might not have the medical skills, but they have the patient empathy skills. They already know how to deal with people that come in the hospital, yep. they're stressed out and they can't deal with it and with the patients and with their families and all of that. So all the interpersonal skills that are actually harder to build and much more like critical, um, they already have. So reskilling people and then moving them around in the company. And the last R that I want to mention is redesigning the work itself. So thinking about how can we take the work apart? Um, one company, Mercy Health, for example, they uh, did um, internal gig work for all of their nurses, offer that to them to say, you don't have to work 40 hours a week. You can, if it fits better for your personal situation, you could work just five hours a week. And they, based on skills, they were uh, basically finding out how to deploy noises to these internal gig work situations. But of course, you need to know what skills they have and what where you can deploy them, because otherwise you have this imbalance of the need and, and where you want to go. But huge benefit for them because people were also, it also helped them retain the nurses and attract them. So they all like help each other in a way. And what we found in healthcare, and we, we quantified that here with a healthcare study um, that we did with, with Eightfold, uh, is that each of these R's have a slice of the problem in a way. So recruiting has the, actually the smallest slice because in this case, because there's just not enough nurses out there. You can try to recruit all you want, but there's just not enough. Um, the next one is retaining people. Of course, you've got to retain people as well. And it's the next area that you want to retain people. Um, and um, and um, next biggest slice, basically, all these retention solutions, reskilling, a much bigger slice. And the biggest slice of all in this case was redesigning the work itself. But you cannot do the redesign of the work itself without the insights, not just on the jobs, because the jobs vary can, the skills insights, as we talked about before. You really need to understand on a deeper level um, how to do this. And we did all of this, by the way, based on the data from Eightfold. And you could do this too for your problem, right? You could uh, identify your problem and say, uh, go to your executives then and say, well, if we have this problem, um, here's how we can solve it. Because what we want you to uh, uh, understand is, are the problems that business executives have, are they actually solvable? Without talent intelligence, you won't be able to get the answer. You will just be able to say, I think we can solve it. I think we can try. I think we can recruit and do all of these things. You need, really need the data. And executives are so keen, of course, on, on understanding the data and insights as well. Jason, I, know I talked a lot. Any any thoughts or any, any comments you have on all of this? No, yeah, no. I think it's a phenomenal story because um, it's much more powerful to tell a story when you're telling a story through data. And it's also ties the fact that it's not a single strategy that's going to get you out of this. You need to have a more comprehensive understanding of the issue and a variety of scenarios to understand what buttons to push and what levers to pull to address all yeah. of the different factors that are weighing in on the challenges ahead. But a big part of this speaks to a lot of the companies that you've been working with are some of the early adopters of this. And yeah. they uh, they they not only are ahead of the curve from some of their peers because of how they've got this visibility and how they've changed their structure, but they're also now setting the pace kind of for what's coming next, which um, was why the Josh Burson company put together this research, which I love, which is on what you refer to as pace setter organizations. Can you walk us through a little bit of that? Yeah, so the pace setters, this was fascinating. When we looked at uh, various different industries, on a, like a global basis, we looked at healthcare, we looked at banking, we looked at uh, consumer packaged goods, we looked at pharmaceutical industry. We said there's a pattern there. There's a pattern that in every industry, there's like five to 10% of the, the companies that do things completely differently and they have completely different outcomes. So they have better financial performance, they have better talent outcomes. They lead the industry with innovation, and they also um, are leaders kind of on our indicators of having what we call systemic HR leadership. So we identified that pace set a kind of team of, uh, of companies in every single industry, um, and we saw that they are not just um, leading the, their industry right now, but they're also exponentially increasing their lead because they're constantly transforming. They're not just transformation ready, but they're always transforming. So those 
those pace setter companies do things completely differently. We like crystallize that into the seven winning strategies of pace setters. And you can read this this report that we have written uh, on the seven winning strategies of the pace setter organizations. But they, in a nutshell, they really reorganize constantly. So they redesign constantly and always look at um, what skills do we need? And they prioritize not just operational skills and roles, but then also transformational roles, transformational skills, technology roles and technology skills, rather than just operating. And in healthcare, for example, that meant they're not just getting the clinical roles in, but they also have a lot of technology and transformation workshop facilitators, like Lean Six Sigma, like um, uh, product uh, kind of uh, like um, design people, basically design uh, thinking people um, in their in their organization, much more so than those companies that are kind of behind the eight ball and just chasing mm-hmm. Um, chasing success. Um, they're also not just focusing on recruiting alone because the talent pool has been fished dry uh, in most co- in most organizations, but they are thinking about how can we use talent intelligence to uh, retain people, to reskill people, to have mobility um, in the company as well. So not just going outside as we talked about before. They're constantly redesigning jobs and employment models and employment options, as I already talked about as well in the healthcare example, but we see this in all these other industries as well. And they have a different HR operating model, a systemic HR operating model. I could talk about that for hours as well, won't do that. But the last thing that really is relevant for for this discussion is they also collaborate across the C-suite. So they really have the whole C-suite working together to solve their big business problems. In the healthcare example, again, as we talked about before, is the, the CEO plays a big role in changing uh, regulatory requirements to basically think about staffing ratios, staffing to patient ratios, all of that. CHRO, of course, has this massive role to redesign the work, to use the 4R model, to use talent intelligence. But the CIO also plays a huge role in using technology to enable um, better healthcare um, support, for example, with technology and automation, CFO critically involved because they're going to look at cost and investment and the COO, chief operating officer, also heavily involved. Um, so and I know we're going to talk about this in a minute here for a little bit and how you phrase what the benefit of talent intelligence is, is going to be different depending on which of the C-suite you're going to talk with. Um, the last thing I want to just mention before we uh, maybe go to the, these like last area where we talk about this, how you communicate to the C-suite and open it up to question is how you measure success of HR is actually going to change too. Change. So if you are trying to convince uh, business leaders, C-suite leaders, the most senior executives, that what you're trying to do is actually adding business value, you're going to measure the success with business success measures. So you can't just say, well, we have, we're more efficient in HR, it costs less money to do um, like HR transaction, to do recruiting, to do uh, reskilling, any of those kind of things. It's also not enough to just say, well, our employees like it, our managers like it, or we have higher engagement and retention. All of these are kind of internal metrics, but how, how, right. why not measure your success of your, um, your initiatives, of your support of talent intelligence by can the company grow? Is the company innovating? Are customers much more successful? And if you measure those, if you provide those success measures, nobody's going to push back because that's what the business really wants to do. They're really looking for those like bottom line and top line business indicators, not just for the HR indicators. And the, the last piece I wanted to jump in and add was another kind of summarization of these pace setter organizations. They're, they're collaborative, they're systemic, wow. And yes. they have people dedicated to this work that are embedded, right? So yes, it's, one of, it's one of these things where w- when you ask a question like who owns internal mobility, who owns change management, who owns um, onboarding, right? There's yes. a lot of the opportunity to go like this because okay. no one's no one because no one owns it or no one's dedicated when the answer is everyone owns it, right? Everybody but this is something it. where they have dedicated people that are embedded, so you get this more collaborative systemic approach. Oh absolutely. I mean the systemic approach is so key for all of this. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for clarifying that, Jason. It's it's for key. the sake of time, I'm gonna jump to uh, I'm gonna jump to the next section. 
and we're going to talk about engaging different members of the C-suite. So for anyone who's following along, we just skipped a poll um, for the sake of time. But in, as part of engaging different members of the C-suite, I do want to ask a poll to get the conversation started. So here is this poll question. And if you are uh, near your, your mouse and you can uh, respond, the question is, how do you currently involve different members of the C-suite to secure buy-in for new initiatives in your organization? How are you currently doing it? Are you able to do it through data with stories like the ones Kathy just walked us through? Right. Here are a couple options here, A, B, C, D, and E. Well, these are all great options. <laughs> I would have a hard time to, to select which one because I think all of these are, are kind of uh, interesting things to, or important things to do. Um, what do you see most successful, uh, Jason, in, in your work? Again, I think a big part of gaining internal champions and buy-in is storytelling, and it's much easier to tell the story when you have the data, right? Mm -hmm. So part of this is tailored communications with specific interests in mind, which we'll talk about next, but it's also this kind of building a coalition, right? And yeah. somewhat, we're used to this in HR, you have to play some of the organizational politics, but you have to align kind of what people are um, interested in what, how they're measuring themselves and how this helps solve their problem. And the more problems you can solve collaboratively, the more things you can do synergistically, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think I think it's key. I mean, I'm so glad you've called out the data-based, uh, fact-based storytelling because that's kind of the business, the language that the business talks. If you think about, for example, like marketing or anything like that or financials, people are used to these like fact-based stories and data, database stories. So yeah. I like it. So you see the answers here. The answers here are a little bit more spread out because it is a little bit of, yeah. the, of an all of the above strategy. Yeah. Um, and it does speak to more of the collaborative and systemic nature of this. But hopefully through some of the content that we've walked you through, you see the building blocks for how you would put something like this together. Um, so again, here, some of the leaders, schedule personalized meetings, foster cross-functional collaboration, seek feedback from key decision points. But all in all, compared to the previous poll, there's a lot more equal value spread out across the strategy because it does take more of a comprehensive approach. So now, just for the sake of time and for the folks that are attending here, wanted to walk you through what this means in terms of execution. So close to home, let's start with the CHRO. Kathy, as you've worked with a lot of CHROs and they've asked a lot of questions and you've tried to influence them and guide them, can you walk us through quickly here kind of what's top of mind for the CHRO and how do you make a play for their support? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they are looking, of course, to um, think about the people side of the business and whatever your business challenge is that we talked about, right? Um, it's going to be very easy to translate that in the CHRO language to say, this is that like not talk about tactics, but talk about how can talent intelligence actually help us address this, this business challenge. Um, so it's, it's really key to think about what's the business challenge you're trying to, uh, to solve for. I mean, every, every CHRO we talk with say labor shortages are huge, skill shortages are huge. We don't have the right skills, well-being, like we don't have enough people, we don't have the right like talent in there. So all of those challenges will probably come up um, for you as well. And the talent intelligence, of course, play there is, is massively important because, well, how, how do we know we don't have the right skills? How do we know yeah. what others are doing outside of our company? How can we benchmark ourselves? All of those insights you cannot get without talent intelligence to say, well, we are in in this. We are, for example, we worked with a pharma company, and they said we don't know if we are we are uh, you looking at the right skills, or if other our competitors are actually looking at other skills for a yeah. research and development group. Well, without talent intelligence, you can't say that, right? You could just guess, or you could say, well, I talked with one person from a competitor, but talent intelligence brings you that kind of uh, holistic story and the database story there. So very important. And I know folks that attend will get a copy of the materials, that framework around identifying the problem and understanding the strategies and that 4R framework is something that would lend itself very well to this CHRO uh, yes. champion. Sure. From, a, from a CEO perspective, I think one of the things that would lend itself well here is explaining and articulating how this isn't just an HR initiative for HR sake, and I loved your slide around not just measuring the benefits within HR, 
but tying them to specific business results, right? I think you've talked about yeah. some of the specific clients you've worked with where yeah. these these yeah. either started the conversation or became revelations of the initiative. But now that we're a little further into it, people can start to gain momentum by approaching it that way. Absolutely. I mean, the CEO will care about growth, profitability, um, future success, uh, innovation, all of those kind of things. If you can tie any of this to uh, to those kind of success measures, you're going to have a win, no doubt. But always uh, tie it to your problem, right? What's the problem that you're trying to solve with this? So yeah. very important. Now, from another stakeholder perspective, the, the chief information officer, CIO, thinks often about different things. How is this delivered? How does this fit into our tech stack? What does this mean from a technology perspective? What does this mean from a digital workplace perspective? Do you want to talk about kind of their role in some of these pace setter organizations or initiatives you've been involved with? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, they have a, really a very important role because they are also thinking about the talent intelligence platform itself, right? Is that fitting into, a, into what we want to do? But then also, they have their own challenges in, in terms of skills and capabilities, especially with the AI coming into place, right? So they have that kind of issue as well. Um, so I think that it's kind of a double play to say, how does it that the actual talent intelligence platform fit in? But then also from your own like organization, usually these are big organization and important organization because every company now is a tech company as we, yeah. as we see, and I think it's true. Um, they all, uh, um, you'll, you'll be able to translate basically the, the benefits of talent intelligence to their needs and their uh, tech team. And then at the end of the day, everything comes down to dollars and cents, right? It's where it's where the rubber meets the road. So our last key stakeholder here is the is the CFO. And I think one of my takeaways from listening to you and spending time with you during this hour is the difference between the industrial approach and the post-industrial approach. And it's not just a widget and an incremental exercise, this now has the opportunity to increase ROI and increase re and synergies and value at more of an exponential level, but it's through this understanding of applying the right skills in the right place. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the CFO place is, is really critical because they hold the budget, right? Uh, but then um, it's very easy to show a huge ROI on this, of course, because just the internal, like, um, like the internal redeployment or reskilling and then mobility story, it's like four times we, we did this study uh, as well at, at some point, it's four times more profitable or more uh, beneficial for the company to uh, uh, redeploy somebody, reskill somebody than to hire from outside. I mean, if you multiply that by how many people you need, if you're a large organization, you have huge ROI right away. So with that, I want to thank everyone for spending their time with us and coming along for the ride. This is a very important discussion that a lot of organizations are having. Um, I'm, a very, I'm very passionate about it, as are you, Kathy. We can talk about this all day. Um, all right, well. <laughs> we, 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 we look forward to everyone um, getting a copy of the materials, or I'm sure there will be a recording available. But thank you again for joining us, and thank you to Kathy and the Josh Burson Company for sharing their insights and their research. Um, and with that, I want to hand the program back over to Connor. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. This webcast is sponsored by Eightfold AI. Eightfold AI delivers the talent intelligence platform, the most effective way for companies to retain top performers, upskill and reskill the workforce, recruit top talent efficiently, and reach diversity goals. Eightfold AI's deep learning artificial intelligence platform empowers enterprises to turn talent management into a competitive advantage. For more information, please visit www.eightfold.ai. Before we sign off, we want to thank our presenters, Jason Servato with Eightfold AI and Kathy Indris with the Josh Burson Company for the information they provided today. And we also want to thank everyone tuning in for being with us and for choosing Charm for HR webcast. That concludes this program.